get right into the text. We are in verses 33, 4, and 5 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Look, read, I'm going to read it out loud and follow with me. This is halfway through 33. Paul writes, as in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. And with that, I think we're good for this morning. God bless you. Uh huh. Um, I remember some of the first weeks as a Christian telling my family all about my, you know, conversion to Christ and how great it was. One of my cousins, uh, a girl, she said to me, there is no way that I will ever become a Christian. You know, I'm like, well, why not? I mean, look at me. I'm so happy. And she goes, because it is just a chauvinistic religion. It's all about male domination. And I'm kind of scratching my head like, what are you talking about? Well, lo and behold, she takes me to this very section of scripture and reads me the words. And she goes, even the guy who wrote most of the New Testament was just a male chauvinist. And he's the guy that you believe wrote these sacred scriptures. Woo, she just wouldn't let it go. Um, now, at the time, like I said, I was kind of a newbie. And so I didn't know how to respond. I didn't know what really to say back. So you know what I did? I just, and here's what you should do when you don't know what to say either. Just kind of step back, cool it, just, just relax. Let the Lord minister to you and just say, look, you know what, I'll, I just know that Jesus is my Savior. He's an awesome Lord, and I believe in him, and I'll just be praying for you. But please, keep an open heart. But that's about all you need to say. Okay, don't, don't worry about having to get into a doctrinal debate or anything. Just leave it at that, and the Lord will honor you. So... Naturally, though, I walk away from there and I think, well, is this about male domination? Is my faith chauvinistic? Is my, is my Lord that way? Is Paul some frustrated old bachelor who just doesn't like women? What's going on? Well, may I say with the utmost confidence, I don't think so. None of that is the case. Of course, one of the rules of interpretation of the scripture is that context matters. In other words, you look at a verse and you interpret that verse, let's say, within the paragraph. And you interpret that paragraph, let's say, within the chapter. And you interpret the chapter within that particular book. And you interpret that particular book with every book of the book. And it gives you clarity, it gives you clarity of thought, it gives you confidence in what you believe. Now, let us make sure we establish context. All right, chapter 14. This is, I believe, our fourth, or it doesn't matter. It's one of our studies in chapter 14. All of them thus far, the key word, order. All of them, in fact, I entitled one of them Order in the Church. It's all about order, a God-ordained, God-designed way for the assembly of believers to behave. Yes, we are ruled by the scripture in how we come together, in what we do, and boy, the heart with which we do it. I'm going to talk about some of that in just a little bit. But that's, that's the key to interpreting verses 33 through 35. Ladies, just to set your mind at ease, okay, I intentionally did this. The very first note on the page, look, look what it says. I want you to write it just the way I wrote it. Paul is 
not capital N, capital O, capital T, teaching that women can't speak in the church. No, he ain't. No, he's not. There is something so important, though, to understand why he words it like this. We need to understand why it is that there is some confusion in the churches. And we need to understand, guys, when I present this, this is what I believe the Lord has led me to in my own study, con con considering context and whatnot. And yes, there is controversy. Yes, there are major teachers, so to speak, um, who stand at their pulpits and they teach. Ladies, quiet. There are others who take this and go too far in the other direction. I just want you to know that this is one of those areas that the Lord led me to teach you in, and um, it's worthy, it's worthy of careful study and prayer. Okay, let's get into it in just a moment. Let's pray, and then we'll look at the text. 1 Corinthians 14, God, we do thank you for bringing us together as the assembly of the believers. God, right here in this sanctuary, in this church, and it is just our desire now that you would give us the ability, that you would give us the gifts, that you would absolutely draw us to knowing your scriptures, to understanding them, and of course, Lord, living them out. God, we want to do that for your glory. We want to do that because Jesus is our Savior. And God, this prayer as well, that if you've brought anybody here who doesn't know Jesus as Savior, that today would be the day of their salvation. We pray it in faith, in Jesus' name, amen. So, how do we know then that God's not prohibiting women from speaking in the church? How do we look at this spirit-inspired text and say, oh, what I know for sure is Paul's not saying, lady, come into the church, keep your lips zipped, and we're good. Well, here's how. Now, remember, these aren't broken up into chapter and verse stuff when Paul writes his letter. It's just one continuous letter. For you and me, all we have to do is go back, which don't do this, but go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul explicitly states, ladies speak in the church. Verse 5, but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. First part of that verse. It's a given that ladies will speak in the church. However, there is a context. There is a regulation involved. Notice he talks about the head covering. Uh, a couple of months ago, we were in 1 Corinthians 11, and I explained that, what head covering meant. But let me give you just a quick recap here. The, the head coverings were very crucial. I think, I think crucial is the right word. In a woman of the church demonstrating that she was a woman of the church. Two, it was symbolic of two things. In the culture of the day, and I'm not just talking about Corinth, I'm talking about all around. In the culture of the day, to, for a Christian woman to wear her head covering was an outward demonstration of the acknowledgement that her husband was the authority over her. Because there are explicit statements in the scripture that say that. I mean, the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. The head of Christ is God. This would be a symbol of acknowledgement. I, I know it. I believe it. And I want people to know it. Um, Ephesians 5 has the, the, an area, you know, uh, wives submit to your husbands as unto the Lord.
Now, we don't need to exposit those scriptures. But what we do know is that the Christian women knew the concepts, understood that they had a God-ordained order in their marriages, okay? So head covering, demonstration. Number two, I said there were two. Number two was very cultural. Uh, you might remember there was the temple of Aphrodite very nearby the city of Corinth, Aphrodite being the goddess, the goddess of lust and physical pleasure. And about every evening or so, they said the thousand temple prostitutes would descend upon the city and they would unfortunately solicit business. Well, one of the ways they did it, no head covering, makeup, and provocative clothing. So for a Christian woman in particular, part of showing her poise and integrity and her commitment to representing God well, she, she dressed in a, this humble manner. And so she wore the head covering. She wore it in such, she, she wore clothing and the head covering, which clearly demonstrated she was a follower of Jesus Christ. So those are two huge reasons why these head coverings were so important. So Paul, what he said was, when you come into the church, you are to demonstrate that you are a follower of Christ. When you exercise, let's say, the gift of prophecy, praise God, you got the gift of prophecy. But he says, you got to be a Christian to do it. In other words, you got to act it. You got to show it. You're supposed to, you're supposed to follow after the role that God has given to you. You might remember when we taught on 11, I had said the women were so happy because they were finally free. He who the Son has freed is free indeed. All of these rules, all of these regs, all of these laws that made you ladies second class, boom, in Christ, didn't apply. Mm, but they were still called to follow after the order. They were still called to demonstrate that they were these women of poise and integrity. Here's what they did. Oh, I better not, I better not skip this. Number two, notice the women flaunted there, and the word there is freedom. So just write down freedom, please. Here's where Paul was going with chapter 11. The women were flaunting their free. I was almost going to have you write flaunting or flaunted, but I didn't even know how to spell it. So I'm like, I'll forget it. I'll just, I'll put freedom down. The women flaunted their freedom in Christ, and look what happened. Remember a big old context? Disorder in the church. Oh. They said there are no rules for us. And you know what went? Pew, off with the head cover. They took that way too far and said, not only is the symbolism gone, but what it symbolized is gone. What, would it, what was it that it symbolized? The authority of her husband over her. It was part of the order of the church. Hey, married couple, this is a crucial part of the order that draws success in your marriage. This is a God-honoring way to live your lives. It's how Missy and I have to constantly pray about and, and really seek God's power to, to make sure that we both fulfill the roles that we are given. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I understand culturally speaking to say, I am in submission to somebody else. Ooh, that can be taken way the wrong way. Nevertheless, Paul says, no go. Order is required. Behavior, role, assumption, those are all required. And if you're going to stray from that, then what are you even talking this, this prophecy stuff? So what if the Lord gave you a gift? There's an order and a rule. Remember last week I left with this, that, prophes that the prophet, I'm sorry, the prophecy is subject to the prophet. 
In other words, it is a choice when we are ordained by God with power, with might, with something that could edify somebody else. You know what? I better make sure I'm being a godly man about it first. When I'm being a godly man about it, I better make sure the way I present it to you, you go, ah, oh, that was godly. If there's confusion there, I need to zip my lip. So we get the context of 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 5. Okay, so you forward to verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, you know that Paul wasn't reversing himself suddenly. Once again then, what must it have been? Disorder. That is the context to the prohibition. So figure Paul's getting the reports. Remember, he's getting the reports about what's going on in the Corinthian assembly. What must he have been, been hearing? I think you get a clue of what he's been hearing by how he words verses 34 and verse 35. The ladies are causing disorder, Paul. And Paul's response is, the key there is the word speak. I want you to just, I don't know if you want to highlight the word speaking, sorry, speaking or speak, whatever your Bible says. That word laleo in the Greek, it is its context. It has to do not with just, oh, you know, pleasant talk, pleasant speech. It has the idea associated with it of a, a, a public loudness. Um, I think in the dictionary you'd find it called a harangue. Um, Alan Redpath is a guy that I read often, but it's interesting the way he commented on that word. He said, the ladies would have spoken in a persistent an argumentative tone. That was the report that Paul received about what was going on in the assembly of the Corinthian church. He's like, what, you're speaking like this? You're supposed to have poise. You're supposed to carry yourself with integrity. Remember, you don't even wear your head coverings. You're supposed to get those on. And now the way you speak is like this? And so his prohibition is more specific to just the way they're not wearing their head covering. Speak right. And if you don't speak right, be quiet. Isn't that the same thing as saying the prophecy, the prophet, <laughs> I can't get it right. The prophecy is subject to the prophet. It is exactly the same. Because that is the ongoing context of 1 Corinthians chapters 11, uh, 12, 13, 14, and you could just carry that one on and on. Yes, that's right. Ladies, do it in order. Do it orderly. But don't even say anything. Now, one other, I guess, relevant aspect to understanding this context is this, all right? This has to do literally with the physical layout of the church assembly. Look how we, you know, we're interspersed, um, husbands, wives, you're sitting together, friends, you're sitting together, irrespective of whether you're a man or a woman. In the tradition of the day, uh, in the Christian church, in the synagogues, you know, if you go like to India, even today in the churches, you will notice the way the assembly is ordered that men would sit on one side, there'd be a pretty large center aisle. And then the women would sit on the other side. Now, there would be a, a man, what's going on right now, there would be somebody who stood up at the front of this congregation, of this assembly, and he would teach the word of God. And as they sat there, they would, just like you are, receive what is being taught. It was always done very orderly, 
very intentionally, and they always expected fruit. They always expected to be built up and edified. You know, it's like, yeah. Okay, here's, here's the problem. Um, well, more of the traditional thing. If, if somebody had a question about what the teacher was teaching, now understand under the, the roles of husband and wife, the ladies always knew that it was right and proper not to like go up to the pastor, if you want to call him that, the teacher, but they would actually go to their husbands at a different time, a different place, and ask him the question. You know, honey, I didn't understand what he's saying grace, we're saved by grace. What does that, what does that mean? And the husband wouldn't be shocked by being asked this. He would understand that a question just might be coming. So he would either have been equipped to answer the question or, and this is part of that order in the church, the men would approach the teacher. Again, not at the, like, one of you wouldn't just stand up and come to him and say, Rod, what are you talking about, dude? <laughs> we would meet somewhere else. And, and he would ask. And then he would take that answer to his wife and praise the Lord there would be that spiritual connection and that spiritual edification. It was just the way things went and it worked. It was very honorable before the Lord. Oh, by the way, guys, let me tell you something. We are called to be those spiritual leaders and I want you to know something. We should be able to confidently encourage our wives to ask us questions. We should be able to go to our wives and say, listen, sweetheart, if you have a question, feel free to come to me anytime. And then you can say this, all right, because then it gets a little scary if you don't. If I don't know the answer, I will find the answer for you. It's a burden we're supposed to bear, and she needs to know it. Hey, okay? that's the way it always has been part of the order okay now let's let's talk about it further suddenly there was freedom no more of this rule stuff hey why do we have to follow what the jewish synagogues did how come we have to follow what all that traditional stuff and what else there was no more of that how come only guys get to ask the pastor what is this so there was another violation so to speak and then another thing hey we believe that the lord is giving us answers right in the middle of the assembly and so you'd have somebody stand up and say you know thus saith the lord and another person would stand up and say blah 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 you know supposedly speaking in tongues and it would become just a, a horrible thing do you remember this too outsiders were looking in paul was like what are you not only are you creating disorder and confusion within the body but you are messing them up so it was yeah this is the report paul gets now we have now we understand why his instructions just be quiet if you don't know how to speak correctly, then <laughs> don't talk. This was, unfortunately, the character of the Corinthian Christian. So, well, was any glory being given to Christ? Of course not. Our God is a God not of disorder, but order. I, I'm, the reason I'm saying that is because I can just hear Paul, I mean, see Paul receiving the report, and I'm thinking like his, his blood's boiling. He is so all about making sure to represent Jesus Christ honorably, orderly, in a way that draws people in, and he's hearing about what's going on. And come on, let's face it, the way he's been talking in this letter, you can just sense it, huh? You just sense that the guy has such a heart to correct them. Number, we'll continue with this concept a bit, okay? 
So you understand the structure. You understand the obligation to order. I want to take this a little bit further in this. Understand that the entire um, primary reason for Christians to be drawn together in the assembly. We are called the assembly. That's why I keep calling us the assembly, the church. Physically, Christians coming together for a purpose. We are the assembly. Why is the assembly here? Primo number one, to learn the word of God. There is not a single thing that takes priority over that purpose. Now, look at number three. I, it's, it's too crucial not to make note of this, so would you please? Order, or I use the word quiet. Paul demanded quiet in the assembly. The orderly use of gifts. Assuming roles correctly. He demanded those things so that people could learn God's word. This is not the Acts 2.42 assembly. The Acts 2.42 assembly is what our life groups are modeled around. This assembly right here is geared toward the specific instruction of God's people in God's doctrine. And, and that's, uh, look back down, please, at verse 35. This will explain context again. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. The implication, the obvious understanding is, if there is something that they need to learn, there was something they were learning. What he says is, if they have a question, if what they hear being taught isn't quite clear, if they need clarity, then get those things. But there's a way to do it. So the entire context there, in terms of this order, has to do with learning the word. Now, that is... That is what Calvary is based on, you know? Pastor Chuck started Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. One of the primary goals of his was to make sure that no matter who you were, whatever you looked like, whatever your lifestyle was, you had a place to gather as an assembly and learn the word of God. It is, it is a fundamental, it's what, it's what we do here. When Pastor Al planted this church, and now I am in this position of teaching. Number one is the teaching, the instruction of God's word. Boy, that was, that's the Calvary movement. If you want to describe it, that just identifies us. It is that crucial, church, where Paul actually says, I would prefer you not even talk in order to achieve this goal. Pretty pretty substantial you know that's that's why it our vision statement basically uh, revolves around this you know we win we equip we release everything is based on the teaching of God's doctrine every part of that is based on teaching and watching the Holy Spirit do a work through his word that's what we want to keep doing this this community of ours being reached with the word and watching God do an amazing work because of it. Huh. I think about our classroom. Think about the kids right over there in the children's wing or the kids over there in the youth ministry, the high school, the junior high. You know what the primary goal there is? Uh, now, this is called age-appropriate. It is age-appropriate instruction in what? The word. So, yeah, it's... It's everything. It's impacting. It's empowering. You guys have the coolest testimonies. I probably hear more of your testimonies than you hear of your testimonies. And let me tell you something. It's a common factor in all of your testimonies. You'll be like, oh, God brought this one woman into my life, 
and I was able to talk to her and find out about her, and then I was able to share the Holy Spirit. And inevitably, there will be a reference to a verse in the Bible that supported the entire encounter. Inevitably, in some testimony, you will say, and Raj, it was just like Paul said. You know, when he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Something like that. So, this is the primary purpose to the order which Paul demands in 1 Corinthians uh, 14, 33 through um, 35. Now, I, <laughs> I, was at, I don't want to hear any awes or boo, but this is where I was going to stop my teaching, but I decided not to. <laughs> I, I could have heard some praise the Lorders or something, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> because I think it really is that simply explained. I think that the whole controversy behind it is really that simply explained. That is my belief. But I think that there is something that is very substantial, another truth that Paul threads into the way he words this. And so I don't want us to miss it. I don't want us to pass it up, okay? So the first thing I want you please to do is in number four of your notes, I want you to write the word church. And here's why. Because what Paul has just said needs to happen applies to any and every church to which the condition applies. What is the condition? Disorder. Any church where there is disorder, here's what you do. Right? So for us, guys, it wouldn't really be a directive. It wouldn't apply to us. These are called church directives. Now, there is a, a, an, another term used for commandments given in the Bible, things that Christians are called to do, known as, and this is number five, a universal directive. Paul threads a universal directive inside a church directive. So a universal directive has nothing to do with condition. It is simply all-inclusive. It applies to every believer. It applies to every assembly. And it applies at all time. This is probably more controversial than what I've just taught, by the way. Here's where it comes from. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11, which we use as a cross-reference to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather... She is to remain quiet. Now, 1 Timothy is known as what's called a pastoral epistle. It's a letter written specifically for the purpose of training up a pastor. In this case, it's Timothy, because Timothy gets to move to Ephesus, and that's where he's going to become the pastor. Now, in this pastoral epistle... Paul must teach Timothy how to run a church. And in his instruction comes this universal directive. It applies to all pastors and all assemblies. When those two come together, it must be a man who is the authority. It must be a man who is the primary teacher to the assembly. Now, one, that word quiet once again has a context. That word quiet here more relates to the idea that when a, that, uh, that a woman in the church is to remove herself from an opportunity where she could become the teacher over the assembly or a part of the church government. Again, it doesn't mean no talk in the church, but there is a context there. 
And Paul, I got to say this, you know what? There is no wiggle room. There is no exception clause. Read those cross references and read what Paul means in context and you simply can't get away from that conclusion. That's the bottom line. Look, the Bible teaches, I believe with utmost clarity, that women can't be pastors. Now, I know there's controversy there. I know there's confusion. I know of women who call themselves pastors. I know of women who call themselves reverends. I know that there are husband and wife teams where he might be called pastor and she would be called co-pastor. I think, I think I have heard somebody call Missy Pastor Missy. I think that's happened one time in our past. She's not Pastor Missy. She's the wife of the pastor, but not Pastor Missy. Um, this is where the idea of design and role are especially crucial to understand. We are different. God just gives us different roles because when we fulfill them, man's sakes, the good stuff happens. I am the provider. My wife is the nurturer. I am the leader. She is my helpmate. I am her spiritual cover. She can come to me with her questions, and I have an obligation to answer them. These are distinct, crucial, puzzle-fitting roles. But sadly, church, listen, what, 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 what's happening particularly in this culture is that people are feeling very free. In essence, you can go back to Corinth. Freedom can be a dangerous thing when you take it too far. People in this culture feel very free to uh, change the clear teaching of God's word, uh, uh, shaping it to fit their preferences rather than letting it shape their preferences. I, there was a show on uh, Valentine's, an Oprah show of all things. On Valentine's Day, it was known as Super Soul Sunday. Super Soul Sunday, maybe you you heard about that. Um, Rob Bell appeared on the show with his wife, Kristen. Now, Rob Bell is the former pastor of a mega church in Michigan. Huge church. He, he Obviously, he taught, uh, ostensibly, he taught Christians the word for many years, and there were thousands of people to whom he taught it. Now, they wrote a book called Zim Zum of Life, A New Way of Understanding Marriage. And on the show, he makes a statement about how people just have this deep, deep longing and this need for companionship. Okay, I, I get that. But he says this, listen, and I'm quoting. He says, whoever you are, gay or straight, it is totally normal, natural, and healthy to want someone to go through life with. A couple other words, then Oprah responds with a question. What, um, when is the church going to get that? Here's Bell's answer. We're moments away. I think culture is already there, and the church will continue to be even more irrelevant when it quotes letters from 2,000 years ago as their best defense. When you have in front of you flesh and blood people who are your brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and co-workers and neighbors and they love each other and just want to go through life together. And Kristen Bell's quote, there are churches who are moving forward and there are churches who are almost regressing and making it more of a battle. Guess what church we are? Ugh, apparently, we're the regressors. Um, listen, it's not, it's not the church causing the battle. It's the culture battling the church. It's not the church battling the, I'm sorry, it's not the culture battling the church. It's the culture battling God and his word. 
And here's the deal, my brother and sister. We are called to stand our ground. And our feet are supposed to be set squarely upon the right teaching of God's word. And, and whether it's this issue of skewing God's definition of marriage, which breaks my heart, or whether it's this skewing of God-ordained leadership and teaching in the church, we cannot give an inch. We cannot deviate from what is clear, from what is orderly, from what is by God's design. We cannot deviate from those things. These are universal directives. These are not cultural directives. These are not church directives. They are universal directives. Now, the remarkable thing, and this is wonderful, is that unlike the culture, we don't hate. Unlike the culture, we don't try to silence those who oppose us. In fact, we engage in dialogue. We see this as an opportunity to hear and receive the hurt or the pain or the confusion of another person, and then in response by the power of the Holy Spirit, give encouragement, give the truth of the gospel, and watch the Holy Spirit do a work in their lives. Hey, we don't react with anything but love. And my heart breaks when there are those Christians who are confused. Maybe they have good intentions, but so did, I think, some of those Corinthians, that all they did was cause confusion. See, the right understanding of God's word gives you the ability to rightly engage with those who oppose God's word. Um, let, me, let me get, okay, with, with that in mind, that principle in mind, let's get back to 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to talk about, again, the pastor, the teaching and the authority, the universal directive. It is confused. You are challenged by this, believer, you are challenged by those who use the scripture to support their point of view. You see, Rob Bell dismisses the scripture. But some of these churches and denominations, they will use the scripture to support this position. Now, I'll just give you, just so that you know, I want to give you perhaps one of their most common arguments or their most common proof, proof texts for supporting the idea that pastorship, eldership is not limited. And they'll also use the same thing to, to say that, you know, not just females, but they'll ordain, say, homosexuals. They'll ordain those who are in a great deal of sin, whatever. But here, let me get back to this. They will acknowledge the clear teaching of that hierarchy, the role of husband-wife. Okay, you can't deny it. 1 Corinthians 11, it says it explicitly there that, you know, men are the leaders, uh, men are the head of the woman as God is the head of Christ. But at the same time, they will tell you and me that that is limited to within the walls of the, of the home. It is marriage. It is a union as one. It is you, O oh man, leading up your household. Remember, you're to lead up your household. So inside of your home, you got it. Now, they will then dismiss the idea of it applying to the greater outside the walls world, the what, outside the house walls world, 
they will dismiss it by quoting things like freedom and equality verses, which I think we understand the context to, but they will skew it. And look, here's, here's a part of the confusion of their argument, is that essentially a man can be the, the ruler, the leader over his wife, the spiritual leader over his wife, Yet at the very same time, she can be his spiritual leader as well by being called his pastor. And one of the roles of pastor is to be a spiritual leader over the sheep that he shepherds. So there is um, a, a disconnect and a confusion that can't be reconciled in their argument. It's, it's, it's very clear in my mind. You can't both be the spiritual leader of somebody and have that somebody be your spiritual leader. But this is the argument in those churches that ordain women and call them pastors. Other arguments exist as well, but we're not going to go there for now. The point that I am making is simply what Paul was all about, the right and proper teaching of God's word. You got to hear it. You got to know it. And what's going on, O Corinthians in the assembly, is preventing you from doing it. So if necessary, go to the extreme. Don't talk. And hey, he, he gets successful. I tell you this almost every study. I say when he writes the next letters to the church, he basically commends them because they listen to the things that he's called to say. Uh, uh, they listen to the things that he said and obey them so this morning i'll tell you what then we're going to leave it at that understanding the important text of women being quiet in the church understanding how you know what we fit the bill right here understanding that when you're a church that does that there is much fruit that is produced Understanding that the Lord draws people to himself through this church weekly. Understanding that you guys have just the coolest testimonies and they are ongoing. Some of you have some stuff you're going to encounter this week. Maybe it's stuff you don't like. Maybe it's stuff that you're intimidated by or shaking because of. Hey, I want this to encourage you, okay? What we know is that no matter the situation, God has designed it. God has ordained it. If you simply follow your role, God's going to prevail. Just know your role. Know God's teaching. And that will be the fruit you'll enjoy. Okay, well, with that said... We are now going to be taking communion together. Talk about following a role. You know, that's how come we get to take communion together. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But for now, would you close your eyes, please?